Every time I teach you about a new plant family, I emphasize the significance of remembering the characters and patterns of that particular family in order to easily recognize any of its members. Whether it's the cross-shaped flowers of Brassicaceae, Fabaceae and their typical legume fruits, or the flower heads of Asteraceae that give the impression of an individual flower. Today I'm going to talk about Poaceae, simply known as grasses. You might think that there is no way you would not be able to recognize a grass plant, so what's the point in learning their family patterns? Well, that's partially true. Grasses are distinctive plants that are usually easily recognized, although many grass-like plants such as sedges or rushes are often confused with true grasses. In fact, we use the term graminoids for all those grass-like plants, including grasses in a strict sense. Grasses are often deemed a difficult group, and that's both because their structures are very small and not as readily seen as in other flowering plants, but also because of the special terminology we use to describe their structures. In today's video, I won't focus on general characters of the family Poaceae, since recognizing this family is not that tricky. We'll rather focus on their unique features and morphology, which are radically different from other flowering plants and need some special attention. Let's dive into it. First, we look at the overall appearance of a grass plant, or its growth habit. Notice the way the grass grows. Is the plant erect, growing vertically from the ground, or does it have any additional lateral growth? Does it grow in clumps? You might need to pull the plant out of the soil to look at the underground structures. Oftentimes, you can see rhizomes, which are modified stems growing horizontally below the soil surface and from which new plants arise. They are usually whitish in color, and as I said before, they are not true roots, but a modified stem. Grasses with rhizomes are referred to as rhizomatous. When the stems spread horizontally above the ground, we refer to them as stolons, and the grasses with such structures are stoloniferous. Both stoloniferous and rhizomatous grasses are said to be sod-forming, which means they spread laterally, often creating dense mats or colonies. Not all grasses have this lateral growth, of course. Grasses might be tufted, creating clumps or bunches, which you can see by looking at their base. These types of grasses are referred to as bunch grasses, and they don't produce any stolons or rhizomes. Moving on to the stems. When talking about grass stems, we use the term culm, but both terms, stem or culm, are correct. Culms are herbaceous, with the exception of the woody bamboos, although these still lack like woody growth in the strict sense. Culms are also hollow, but there are some exceptions, such as corn, whose stem is pithy rather than hollow. When we look at the cross-section of a culm, it's round, although some species have flattened stems. If you find that the culm is free-angled, then you're likely dealing with a sedge, which is not a true grass. Remember, sedges have edges, but true grasses are round. Going up the stem, you come across multiple thickened areas. Those are nodes. They look like joints, and they might even be referred to as knees. They're pretty easy to spot, but if you're in doubt, just run your fingers along the column and feel for the thickened, swollen areas. Nodes, as opposed to the rest of the culm, are solid, not hollow. Node features, such as the color or whether they're hairy or not, are also often used for identification. The sections of a stem between the nodes are called internodes, literally meaning between the nodes. Nodes are the places from which the leaves emerge. Now, that might not seem right to you since we see the leaves diverging from the stem much higher up. This will become much clearer when we look at the anatomy of a grass leaf. The leaf of a grass can be divided into two parts. There's a blade, which is the part diverging from the stem, and a sheath, the part that hugs the stem all the way to the node. The sheath often surrounds the stem so tightly that you can't distinguish it from a naked comb without dissecting the parts. 
pay attention to whether the sheath is open or closed, meaning whether the margins are fused together or free, as that's an important character. The area where the blade turns into the sheath, sometimes referred to as the collar region, deserves extra attention. Carefully pulling the blade away from the stem reveals a vertical membranous flap called a ligule. Ligules come in different shapes and forms. They can be completely missing, be short or long, membranous, or they can present as just a row of hairs. The base of the leaf blade sometimes has these small ear-like projections that are sticking out or wrapping around the stem. These are auricles, another crucial character for grass identification. As for the leaf arrangement, you may come across the term distigus, which describes the two-row or two-rank arrangement of the leaves on a comb, which is typical for grasses, but might be more or less conspicuous in different species. Let's move from vegetative to reproductive parts of a grass plant. The inflorescence is the most useful identification character of grasses. As opposed to the majority of flowering plants, the individual unit of an inflorescence is not a flower, but a spikelet. Now we're getting into those small features, so a hand lens or a microscope would be really helpful for you to have at this stage. While in some species locating a spikelet is really easy, in others it might be quite difficult. Understanding the structure of a spikelet is crucial, so you can then work your way from the small parts to the whole inflorescence as opposed to trying to go the other way around. I hope this makes sense. At the base of a spikelet, there are two bracts, which we call glooms. First, lower gloom, and second, upper gloom. They are attached to an axis, a racula. Remember that a racula is never branched. So continuing up the racula, we come across florets. There might be multiple florets in one spikelet, and they are positioned alternately along the racula. Just like at the base of the spikelet, the base of a floret consists of two bracts. The lower, outer one, is a lemma, and the upper, inner one, is a pallia. Some species have awns on their lemmas, which is an important feature to notice. Another character that often comes up in identification keys is the number of veins on the lemma, the pallia, or on the glooms. For this, you definitely need a magnifying device, though. Back to our florets. The lemma and pallia serve as protective bracts for a very valuable structure inside, a flower. And the grass flower looks nothing like your typical flower. Grasses are wind-pollinated, so there is no need to have showy, colorful flower structures to attract pollinators. I made a video where I focused on all the tiny details of a grass flower, so go and watch it if you want to see pictures of all those cool features. With the naked eye, you will probably notice only the anthers, as they're sticking out, dispersing pollen. They might be differently colored, and they are quite conspicuous when grasses are in bloom. Florets can be male, female, bisexual, or even sterile, so keep that in mind as an explanation for why some florets look different or seem to be missing some parts. Now, this was a general description of a spikelet, but there might be exceptions, as some parts might be modified or missing. If you're overwhelmed by all the different terms and characters, I prepared a visual guide, where you can see all the characters together. You can get it via the link in the video description. Now when we're confident in recognizing one flowering unit of a grass, a spikelet, we can finally get into the inflorescence types, which is something that many guides and keys start with. We determine the inflorescence type based on the arrangement of spikelets on a central axis, a rachis. When the spikelets are attached directly to the rachis and they are sessile, meaning they don't have any pedicels, the inflorescence is a spike. If the spikelets are attached to the rachis by pedicels, we talk about a raceme. The most frequent inflorescence type in grasses is a panicle where the individual spikelets are attached to pedicels and the pedicels are then attached to branches that are coming off the rachis. These free inflorescence types are the most common ones, 
But as always, not every single species will fall neatly into one category, so keep that in mind. I hope this video provided you with a deeper understanding and appreciation for grasses, and I would love to hear from you, especially if you're going to try to use this knowledge to identify any grasses. Please consider supporting my work by joining Nature Clearly Patreon, so I can continue creating more educational content for you, and a big thank you goes to my existing patrons, who keep supporting me. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.